um, welcome to the, call, the Cloud Computing Meetup. Uh, my name is Amy Neeser, and I'm the Consulting and Outreach Lead in Research IT. And for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're an organization on campus that is really poised at the intersection of research and technology. And we can help identify cloud, high-performance computing, virtual machine, data management, um, and secure data solutions uh, related to your research. So our goals are really around advancing research through IT innovation and helping researchers navigate the many tools and requirements and options on campus, as well as advocate for researchers' needs and perspectives. Um, and one of the ways that you can get in touch with us is we have weekly office hours on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So if you are a researcher looking for some help or somebody else on campus or in the broader community that would like to collaborate with us, I will drop that link in the chat. All right, so we're gonna get started with a couple um, announcements. Um, and before that, I want to thank some folks. So this cloud computing meetup, um, I'm delighted that I get to host today, but this is a group effort um, between the Division of Computing, Data Science and Society, um, IST, Information Services Technology, Research IT, which I was just talking about, as well as Skydeck. Um, we were saying earlier was, as people were getting in that that first picture on the slide is taken from Skydeck and it's um, beautiful up there. And so we're happy to have them as partners and hopefully someday we will be back in person there again soon eating pizza. So thank you to all those folks, as well as Tara, who is helping drive all of this and pull the levers and play the music behind the scenes. So thank you to Tara. Um, and a few announcements for all of you. Um, I wanted to mention that um, Research IT and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab have been partnering on starting to offer some commercial cloud training. So we had an intro to AWS last week. Um, I think we'll be looking at working with GCP next to offer a, an intro training for that and kind of make our way around the different vendors. And so um, just wanted to mention that that's happening and I will be sure to keep you all in the loop about that, especially those of you who are part of the cloud community of practice, look for announcements there. Um, I also wanted to mention that I think some of you might remember from last month that our uh, colleague Camille Crittenton, who works for Citrus and the PRP, the Pacific Research Platform, um, she announced their symposium that they had recently. And she wanted us to mention that those videos from the symposium are available and I'll drop a link uh, in the chat to those as well. And Camille is going to be here for the August meetup, so in two months, and she's going to be doing a nice wrap up of that PRP symposium. Um, so look for information about that. And then um, my co-planner, Anthony Swen, um, is here from CDSS. And I believe, Anthony, you have a few updates you'd like to share. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Um, again, some of this might be uh, old news to folks in the community already, especially if you're at Berkeley. Uh, but I want to provide a quick update about the, the computing data science and society, the division. Uh, we are we recently received another round of uh, 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 gifts uh, to really help to build a new building that will be hosting. Uh, the building is called the Gateway, by the way, and they'll be hosting uh, uh, folks, including the School of Information. Uh, bids, uh, the undergraduate data science programs, um, computer science and statistics departments. So we are making progress and uh, love to have your continued collaboration or feedback about such a the initiative. And also we're proposing, uh, trying to submit proposals to become the first college in the, you know, in the, at the university in the last 60 years or so. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of exciting things happening and really still want to be uh, really integral part with the, the rest of the IT and data community on campus. So uh, that's it for me. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. That's excellent news. Um, all right, so moving on, um, we would just like to do a very quick poll with all of you um, to get a feel for who's in the room. So if you could please on your devices, go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. If we click on that, it'll show you at the top of the screen here this code. So please enter 49514529. And we're just wondering how's, how's everybody feeling today? Let's do a quick check in and see where folks are at. Okay. 
Looks like folks are doing pretty good with actually a little bit in each of the areas. We've got some greats, some hanging in there. Some could be better. That's totally okay too. Nice, overall pretty good, excellent. I'm doing pretty good today myself. Happy to have you all here. All right, one more question. And that is what part of the community are you from? I hope I didn't leave off any categories this time. Looks like we've got a bunch of Berkeley IT staff, fair amount of staff. Look at our students this time. This is awesome. Love seeing that. We've got some faculty, academics. Welcome to our guests. Nice. I love how this changes every month. I think last month we had a fair amount of folks from the local community, but not as many students. So love to see this. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Tara, for clicking all of those buttons. So without any further ado, um, I would love to get to our main programming. We have a couple of wonderful guests here that I am excited to introduce. So um, this month, we're delighted to focus on cloud at the UC Berkeley School of Information. And we have two speakers today. We have Kyle Hamilton, who is um, the Master of Information and Data Science or MIDS instructor and alum at the UC Berkeley School of Information. And Kyle is also a PhD researcher at the Technological University of Dublin. And then we also have um, joining Kyle is Luis Viario. And Luis is a Master of Information and Data Science, also MIDS instructor and alum at the UC Berkeley School of Information, and is also an enterprise cloud architect at Accenture. So I love that we're getting these kind of cross-cutting perspectives on cloud from the academic side, from the commercial side. And I'm very delighted um, to welcome you. And we are excited to learn about your current work and research using the cloud um, at the School of Information. So we'll turn it over to you. And thanks for being here. Thank you, Amy. Um, and thank you, Louise, for joining me uh, here. Perhaps um, we should share our slides um, yes, and yes. then maybe we can do an introduction uh, on that slide with, with our little pictures. <laughs> yeah, so here we go. Can anyone see me? <laughs> Looks great. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, uh, happy to join you, uh, Kyle. So, um, um, so I think this has already been said and done. I, I don't know if, if you want to add something up, but uh, probably you are well known here in the business. <laughs> so well, needs no introduction. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm that famous. Um, so I've been teaching in MIDS for the last four years um, in 261, which is the machine learning at scale advanced course in the uh, master's program. Um, and our, our stack has been uh, Hadoop and Spark, and we've used all different cloud providers, including AWS and, and Google, and I believe currently on Azure. Um, I'm actually not teaching this semester, so Louise can speak more to that. Um, I'm currently uh, doing my PhD in Dublin, Technological University Dublin, um, and I'll just briefly introduce a use case, which is sort of kind of has to do with my research. Um, it's related, uh, but hopefully uh, will make sense to everybody. So yeah, Louise, did you want to add anything? Well, I'm just happy to say that I'm uh, uh, I'm a Kyle's product. Um, <laughs> I, I took the class back in, um, what was it, summer 2019? And uh, I mean, probably the 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 course that I uh, took the most of the entire MITS program. And then I became a TA probably for, for four terms, I think, and finally, this semester, I, I started uh, as an instructor. So, um, but yeah, so uh, so happy to be related to to Mids Berkeley and Kyle's work. So, um, and uh, I joined um, Accenture uh, a little over a year ago, 
and I'm working on a, um, I was assigned to Google PSO, which is a consulting branch for Google Cloud. So that's why you're going to see a lot of Google Cloud in this presentation. And uh, I'm currently working with a Fortune 10 company um, and uh, very much related with what Kyle and I will be presenting. So. Okay. So um, some of the um, topics that we're gonna talk about here, uh, we're gonna start with some key concepts in cloud computing. Um, uh, Kyle then will talk about uh, machine learning use cases. And then uh, I will try to make sense of how can we put that together when it comes to executing or scheduling those workloads and how does it look in, in the diagram. Right, so, and then we'll be happy to open it to questions, okay. Um, so some of the key concepts in, in cloud computing, um, it all started, um, well, not the cloud computing, but when it comes to big data. So it all started with this MapReduce model. Uh, you probably, some of you might be aware of this Google research paper back in 2004. It's uh, if you're in the big data space, you have heard of this, right? And this way of tackling uh, very large data sets in uh, either train models or parse or ingest data, right? It doesn't matter what uh, the final use case is, but when you're dealing with big data, so, so you need a different approach because a single machine, you basically you don't have enough firepower, right? And uh, this, this Google research paper, mostly authored by Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gemawat. I think there were uh, a couple others, but basically Jeff Dean and Sanjay right now, they are the top two engineers in Google and in Google research. So um, uh, pretty well known. There is a fantastic article written by uh, in, the New, in the New Yorker, I think. So if you if you're interested in how that relationship and their contribution to science, big data, and cloud compute, so it's a very interesting um, article. Then uh, a couple of years later, we uh, we found out about Apache Hadoop, which was like the first major open source technology uh, founded by Doug Cutting and a few others. So Hadoop was basically the first, the, the first open source tool that tackled this um, MapReduce uh, framework. Before that, basically the MapReduce only existed in Google and it was proprietary. But finally, when, when this uh, Google research paper went out, so that's, that was basically the inspiration to, to build Hadoop. And then we should always hear, at least at least here at Berkeley, we should always talk about Apache Spark, right? As uh, it was founded by UC Berkeley students, and basically is is the evolution of Hadoop, right? Uh, so Hadoop was mostly based on streaming data from disk, mapping and reducing, but writing back back to disk. So uh, Apache Spark, what what did differently was uh, the the use of memory, right? And uh, all of this is uh, distributed compute, right? So you will build uh, clusters and then you will execute your workloads, right? So, uh, so we got these tools, Hadoop, we got Spark. And then in cloud, what we do is create a cluster using VMs. So, uh, well, no. So, there's been a lot of innovation on the cloud business, and um, uh, there there are a lot of offerings now when it comes to MapReduce services APIs in the cloud. I am going, only going to speak of what I know, and since ninety percent or probably ninety five percent of my work is in Google Cloud, so DataProc is the uh, it's it's actually a, a, a one of the top products in the entire stack, right? Of, of the Google Cloud platform offering. 
So data proc basically is a fully managed service when it comes to open source clusters for big data, right? So they are flexible. The, uh, you can load basically uh, Java jars. If you are in this, uh, if you're a Scala programmer, you can bring any Scala package. If you're familiar with Anaconda, then you can bring all, all these Python libraries. Um, you can run uh, so many flavors, not just uh, Apache Spark and Hadoop. There are a bunch, there are like 30 plus flavors that you can load, uh, including the top ones is um, Flink, Presto, Pig, and Hive. You can add very tight security. So you, uh, with the introduction of Apache Ranger, you can go at the column level when it comes to security and you can have policies for who can access what in, in the mid, uh, basically behind the, the metadata store that you build around data proc. Also, you can uh, have a Kerberized cluster so you can tie security between uh, communication between nodes. And uh, uh, I, I think the, the, the major thing on, on data proc is that it's very cost effective, right? So you can create clusters on demand. We are actually introducing a concept in, um, in this company, uh, it's data proc ephemeral clusters and you get charged for the second. So at the very moment you terminate the cluster, so uh, that's where the billing stops. So very cost effective. And obviously is uh, um, there's, there's nothing except the, the managed service. Every component in this, in this data proc service, it's all open source. Pretty much 99% is Apache something. So Hadoop, Kerberos, Ranger, Presto, Hive, all of this is, uh, the, most of the components belong to, to the Apache Software Foundation. And uh, you can now also have Jupyter Notebooks on top of it. So, so plenty, of, plenty of options around this uh, data proc service. So um, um, then we have these uh, jobs in, in machine learning, right? So uh, Kyle, you wanna talk about this? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so we're just gonna talk about one use case because I think for the time that we have, that's plenty. Um, so this is uh, something very um, similar to what I'm working on in my PhD research, um, but perhaps a little bit more um, uh, relevant to everybody here. So. We want to design and build a universal skills knowledge graph. So this use case actually comes from a company that I consult for still as I'm working on my PhD. Um, and it's this knowledge graph aspect of it that relates to my own research. So currently there's a trend towards skill-based learning and hiring. Um, and I, if you're following those kinds of trends at all, um, but even though there's some efforts been made to map the skills that are learned in academia um, to the demand in industry, um, most of the credentials that uh, folks earn, whether they be degrees, badges, certificates, do not come with that sort of level of granularity. Um, and there are very few standards defining the, what the skills actually are, how they relate to each other, and what's actually required by industry. So this is a really, really big area um, that needs tackling. There's people talk about the skills gap, you know, between academia and industry. Um, and there, there are efforts. Uh, we're not the only company that's <laughs> trying to solve this problem. Um, and it would obviously make matching candidates to jobs much more efficient if we all spoke the same language when it comes to skills. But of course, to get agreement <laughs> from every single company and every single school, um, even just in the United States, is completely unrealistic. So um, it makes sense to design some kind of a, an architecture that can ingest the existing knowledge 
So things like resumes, job requirements, job recs, curriculum, uh, and, and existing taxonomies and standards because some do exist. And then model and ontology, which can then be used for both information retrieval as well as reasoning. Um, so in addition to kind of mapping the skills of the world to a single framework, um, we can additionally do some, uh, potentially do some reasoning on those skills as well. Um, and a knowledge graph can grow, right? So it can contain all kinds of um, heterogeneous data data points. Um, so not just skills, but potentially employers, um, educational institutions, um, and the like. Um, and we can then analyze this graph uh, and uh, predict links. So there's a link prediction problem here. There's actually lots and lots and lots of uh, <laughs> problems that could be addressed using this kind of knowledge graph. But obviously, such a system requires massive storage and, and compute capacity, but also continuous maintenance, right? Because this is a, an inherently dynamic ecosystem, skills demands change, and, and how we talk about skills and how we define them, just the vocabulary itself changes. So on top of being really big data, <laughs> and on top of having to compute over all of this really big data, it's constantly evolving. So that's that's the use case, and I don't want to go too too deep into it because I think the focus is more on the technology and, and how the cloud can be used to pursue this goal. So I'm going to let Luis take take it from here, and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. So so we started talking about bolts and nuts, and now uh, we talked a little bit about the substance, right? Because uh, so, so Apache Spark, Hadoop, they're all great technology tools, right? But they're built for, for these kind of uh, use cases, right? So, so now going back to, uh, so I have, um, let's say that most, and uh, most of you will be familiar with Spark. So I have this uh, Spark tool deploy in a data product that auto scales. It can go to whatever you want in nodes. So you can tackle any size of data, as long as the use case is um, parallelizable. So then, data proc is your is your choice. But now, we need we need to talk about a a platform of data science in an organization, right? So, how often do you need to uh, submit a workload like this? Is it is it on demand as well, or is it daily or it needs to run every x amount of minutes or every week so i would like to talk about the next tool that will be in the mix which is apache airflow apache airflow founded in 2014 and uh, founded in uh, inside airbnb and it was basically uh, the reason apache airflow exists is because at some point in in a big organization in when you have a, a big data uh, big data science platform you will have a bunch of workloads right so you need to manage all your workflows and apache airflow uh, what are you doing in you know in in airflow instance you basically are creating dags where you can um, are you, if if you guys are familiar with with cron jobs in the Linux environment. So then Airflow will be your cron job, but in a cloud service. So instead of deploying or executing processes or scripts, I'm deploying cloud infrastructure. That's basically it. And why? Because uh, I might need to run these, this use case, this, this workload in, in, in a certain frequency or every time a user hits an endpoint and calls a certain API. So I need to orchestrate, right? I don't want to have a massive data product cluster running, running 24 seven, right? Uh, because at some point, big data means big bucks, right? So probably I, I will have that infrastructure ready 15 minutes before I, I need to start working on, on, on my use case, right? 
So uh, putting everything together is, um, and this, this diagram can potentially change a lot, right? But in this case, we're thinking that you, we might have a team of data scientists in some organization. And uh, they, they are probably running other stuff, but at some point they call uh, this API that is working this, um, uh, this workload, right? right? So, so in Google Cloud, we can have these cloud endpoints, which basically are uh, an extra layer and uh, it's basically how we create APIs. But this could potentially change depending on on the on the um, on the details on on how the data science team works, right? And then here's Cloud Composer. Cloud Composer is also a native service in the Google Cloud Platform, which basically instantiates Airflow. Once I have Airflow running in maybe one or two VMs, Cloud Composer will, will abstract that and will uh, and will have a fully managed Airflow instance. Then I can create a DAG that basically spin up a cloud data product cluster. It will pull either from cloud storage where I have raw data, or I might have this data in, in, in a relational state in a database or I might need to go outside to a repository um, or just raw data somewhere, right? Uh, we don't care. So if, if you're familiar with Spark, we can read zip files, we can read databases, we can, uh, we can actually pull data from BigQuery. I, I, I should have put uh, BigQuery somewhere, but um, sometimes these this use cases, they don't have um, um, relational data, so so we need we need to do a lot of a, a lot of parsing, right? Until I get the data in a certain format that I can train a model or I can uh, put some analytics on it. So Airflow will take care of deploying the cluster, then submit the job, pull the data from any source. And then produce some output. And in, in, in this case, I, I know I put a second cloud endpoint, but it might be the response of the same API, right? Or it could be that the output needs to go into BigQuery. And in BigQuery, we can put Data Studio, which is basically your, um, um, your dashboard or your uh, um, uh, Looker or what's the other very popular, uh, someone remind me, uh, um, just forgot the name, but yeah. So any, um, it's a Looker. Um, uh, would be like Tableau or something. Yeah, yeah, Tableau. Yes, there you go. Okay. So, um, so anyways, but, uh, the, but mostly the, the cloud compute happens here. Between Cloud Composer, you have, you have an instance that is executing a DAG. You have uh, basically three steps, create cluster, then submit the job, and then delete cluster once the job is finished. And here in Dataproc, you might have 10 nodes, 20 nodes, right? Uh, it all depends on on your Spark or Hadoop or Hive uh, job, right? And uh, that's um, that's basically it. Um, um, should we open it for questions? And thank you all, by the way, for attending here. Yeah, so th thanks, Luis. This is a very, very broad overview because our hope is that people have questions and we can address those questions rather than trying to just present one thing. Um, if you have specific questions, um, that'll, be, that, that'll be great. I'm just gonna go back to the diagram if, uh, because it might help on the questions. Thank you both, Luis and Kyle, very much. Well, while folks are thinking of questions, feel free to either type them in the chat and I can read them for you, or if you want to unmute yourself, 
everybody is very welcome. I was wondering for the class that you're teaching, how large of a class is that? And I was just thinking about the provisioning of credits for that. And I believe, Anthony, did you help with some of the provisioning of credits for this class? So I'm just wondering about the scale and how some of that worked. Right, uh, we, we work with our partners from Microsoft uh, to provide some credits. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure the class has used GCP before AWS. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I guess, why don't you guys answer the question first that Amy had? I'll follow up. Well, yeah, so the class I, is, sorry, oh, did you want to answer this one, Luis? Oh, yeah, so I've, I've, I've been working with Steve to, uh, to get the credits from Azure. So, when when we go like big data when it comes to size um, uh, it's it's more towards the end of the course so uh, we have five homeworks and a final project and for homework one two three and four we use a um, uh, what we call uh, um, mid-size data so you can run it in a single vm but then uh, we partner with Azure in Databricks, and Databricks is also a um, a very comparable service uh, such as Dataproc. Uh, I don't believe Azure has a native offering such as Dataproc. So, but uh, but I think what they're offering right now is this partnership with Databricks. So that is basically the big data um, data science unified platform that they have. Um, I might be wrong, so if someone knows about it, so might, but but I think that's uh, that's where Azure stands is standing right now. Yeah, and up until this semester, we were working mainly with AWS. Um, we did a few semesters using GCP, so Google Cloud, um, and we've been working with Databricks for a number of semesters um, to sort of simplify the learning curve. Because actually um, trying to understand all of the cloud architecture and technology while also learning machine learning from scratch, <laughs> um, you know, at scale in a MapReduce paradigm, these are all very big topics that could be a course in and of themselves. So one of the things that I've tried to do over the last several years is to streamline the sort of cloud architecture for the course. And the size of the course is there's 15 students per section is usually four to six sections per semester. Um, I was usually coordinating all those sections um, while teaching one or two or sometimes more. Um, and then, um, yeah, so Databricks is a service that that sort of allows you to just go in, open a notebook, uh, write your Spark codes, and press go, right? And all of the setup, the the cluster setup, and and everything else is taken care of for you. So in the beginning, in the very beginning of 261, maybe some five years ago, it was kind of left up to each student <laughs> to handle their own infrastructure, um, and that was really, really, really difficult for people. So yeah, that's how we run it now. So I want to follow up with that briefly. I know other people have questions is, um, it seems like we, we, the university and these courses are running on a lot of gifts and credits from these firms. And I, I think Dave Riggs is not charging the course at all. Do you think that's a permanent feature of where we're going in terms of like to run these courses will be just, we were counting on gift credits forever. Uh, yeah. Or is there another, you know, I mean, I'm sure this is a kind of a dilemma we're kind of grappling with because so many of our research and, uh, and you know, a lot of courses are depending on cloud credits because these, some of these courses, uh, you know, running these systems are not cheap per se. So I wonder if you, both of you have views on this, uh, just whether these classes will be keep on running on gift credits or will we ever start charging for um, these to our students? I have lots of ideas about that. I um, actually have quite an, some opinions about that. Um, so obviously it's tough relying on gifts. Um, we've been very, very lucky that um, Databricks have been so generous and, and AWS was generous as well. But um, recently what I've heard is that that, those, that funding is kind of running out a little bit. So, and, and the truth is, 
cloud, especially for students, <laughs> you know, it is expensive for individual people, individual researchers, individuals, you know, paying for compute in the cloud. It's one thing for Google to, you know, run uh, models that cost millions of dollars, but as researchers and, and individuals, we can't compete with that. So I actually believe that we really, really need to focus on uh, developing AI that does not need so much compute and, and to you know, reduce our footprint. Um, just in terms of the iSchool and how that's going to continue to be funded, well, I'm not you know, in a position to, to discuss that really or, or certainly not make any decisions. I do think students do, uh, they, they, they would like the school to pay for those credits because the tuition is expensive. Um, there's no, no two ways around that. Um, I think the whole budgeting, um, the budgeting issues around all of this are very, very complicated and um, I'm not sure what the solution is going to be. Yeah, so on, 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 on that angle, we, we've been working, so it is what it is, so cloud, Big data means big bucks, but but having said that, uh, I think we found a way to make these um, the what Jimmy says per person's big data infrastructure. So uh, so, so first of all, we only we only require uh, this complexity and in infrastructure at the very end, right? And that's where we rely mostly on these credits, but. Um, um, if you go to any cloud or, or the three major clouds, right? Microsoft's, Google's, and AWS, somehow they have a, a way to, you know, uh, as, as soon as you open a, your account and if you're using berkeley.edu, you get some credits, right? And you can get away with the, uh, probably the first projects in, in the class that doesn't require a multi-node cluster or multi-compute. Right, you still are working, you know, in parallel because you're leveraging all the cores in in that VM. But but at some point we need to, because it's mach machine learning at scale, right? So um, and and still there are plenty of ways. So going back to my example on cl on cloud data prod, so just uh, um, there are ways to make this more efficient, but but I mean, uh, it, it's, it's costly, right? And what you cannot do is just to have on your own as, as a researcher to have a cluster running 24 seven, right? So for that in class, we, we really encourage to have a, a life cycle on development, uh, try, to, try to develop at, at, at local level first. Um, with a few cores, with maybe mid-sized data sets or even toy data sets. And then you can start firing, uh, you know, in clusters such as uh, Databricks or Cloud Data Prog and be very, very conscious about uh, having, you know, some policies in place where, you know, uh, after X amount of minutes, uh, just shut the, shut the cluster down because otherwise you'll be you'll be drained on your wallet, right? Or on credits. So, um, so yeah, so um, we, we, we try to encourage people to be really aware of that all the time. So, so still you can, you can have a taste of it, but, um, but yeah, so there's um, just, just don't leave stuff unattended, right? We've seen people that uh, if you remember, Kyle, when we were giving away, I think it was at, at the beginning, it was $200 in credits in GCP, then it got to 100. And there were a few people that, hey, my, my $100 went away in one week, right? Yeah. So, yeah. He, yeah, yeah, that's definitely so. something that we try to teach people is how to be mindful of the spend, because ultimately, um, and, and funnily enough, like when people were being asked to spend their own money, 
it was easier to, <laughs> in a sense, to, yeah. to motivate people to, to watch, to, to, you know, write efficient codes. Um, but of course, we don't want people to have to do that. We do want some funding, yeah. And the other thing is that we don't require a book for the class. So we have, I would say we have material in excess for class. You know, we have no books, everything is open source. So you don't have to pay a license for anything. Um, we have notebooks, we have PDFs, we have books, uh, uh, digitalized books. We recommend to buy a certain books, but they're not mandatory. And uh, in the last terms, what we've been advising people following these this, uh, tips or uh, suggestions on how to handle cloud services, I think we, we're down to, if, if you are really following all, all, all of the guidance, you're probably spending $30 the entire course out of your pocket, you know, with VMs and uh, small clusters. So, and storage, right? But the storage is very cheap. So what 80% uh, of the cost is compute, right? It's a lot cheaper than a lot of textbooks. That's interesting. Yep. So I remember paying more than a hundred bucks for uh, even some uh, PDFs, right? That were made available somewhere and books, right? So. Yeah, but don't get the wrong impression though. If you're doing everything right and you're writing good code, <laughs> then that's how much you'll spend. But when you're a student and you're learning and you don't know how to write efficient code yet, you can run well, well over that. <laughs> and I can speak from personal experience. When I first took the course five years ago, I spent a lot more than that <laughs> trying out all kinds of different things. So um, yeah. That's true. It varies widely. <laughs> oh, so also a bit of context that uh, we, we also help run the uh, campus-wide data hub or Jupyter mm -hmm. hub and uh, cost-wise for that is far lower. We cap it to like just have, you know, one core or something and very limited memory and it's less than a dollar a month now. So there's just interesting to gauge the different costs of different courses. Uh, but I, I think we're all striving for efficiency going forward and uh, yeah. Thank you for the answers. Yeah. I see that there was a question in the chat about vendor lock-in. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that hasn't been an issue. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it just hasn't really been an issue. We've used different vendors, GCP, AWS, now Azure, and I, maybe the closest that we've come to vendor lock-in is maybe with Databricks because we're now used to using Databricks and we've kind of set up all our homework assignments and um, in-class notebooks and everything else on Databricks. And that's a, you know, some of their notebook syntax is a little bit different than your usual Jupyter notebook. So in that sense, um, we're maybe a little bit locked in because we'd have to rewrite those notebooks to use a different service provider. Um, but in terms of cloud, um, not really. Uh, it's all, they're all very, very similar to use actually. And then you don't, there's no contracts. There's no, you know, it really hasn't been an issue. I don't know if Daniel, if you had any follow-up questions about that or if anybody else has any questions or comments. Yeah, there's always been vendor lock-in, right? So it's just moved at, moved up to the cloud level, I believe. So, you know, at some point, something won't be available on some other service. So I think it's something you just have to deal with. Yeah, I suppose when you go out in industry and you have a production, you know, environment, and maybe Luis can speak more to this because he has more experience in industry, um, then yes, but not for we do for 261. So Luis, do you want to take that? Yeah, well, in um, speaking on the class, um, we are pretty much uh, containerized. So we don't have these uh, dependencies if, let's say, uh, uh, at some point we move out from just just as we did right so we were with aws now we're we're moving with azure but uh since we focus mainly on pyspark in this course 
So technically any transition will be smoother, right? And at the very start, we always encourage people using containers, right? So all the, uh, all the hassle, uh, I mean, still is, is by, by, by encouraging people to go with containers, that doesn't mean that it's going to be a, a, an easy ride. Right. So there's always learning curve when it comes to containers, but at least you, um, if, if we were going back to my slide where we're like, okay, so, so we found out about Hadoop, we found about, uh, about Spark. Now let's set up a cluster on our own using VMs. That is a nightmare. Right. Um, and if you even setting up Spark or Hadoop in a single node, it is a nightmare. Right. So by using containers, we, we abstract much of that hassle, right? Still, uh, it, it, it takes some time to understand the concept of containers, right? But now moving away from the class in, in, in production, in what I do at work, it's all data proc and it's all making applications containerize. You basically drop your code in a GCS bucket, which is your basic storage, right? Cloud storage, but everything, everything runs uh, every time you deploy a cluster. Uh, it's it's only it, so so the only difference in substance is your code, right? So um, I think in class we 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 really talk about um, if if you pay attention to every homework. It, there's always a toy data set before going to probably the the big jobs where you need to train a model in in the homeworks right so it's 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 all about making sure first that your code works and then that code you can take it anywhere you want right as long as you're able to deploy infrastructure that has these dependencies and ultimately they they um, they're compatible with PySpark Right. Um, in production, you get to see not only PySpark. PySpark is very common between data scientists. But then when you when you talk with data engineers, you probably see more Scala or Java, which is way more complex. But uh, but I think in from experience with the class, we have we have moved from different cloud services and 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 um, uh, we haven't had a real problem moving these Py, these PySpark codes from one vendor to another, right? So yes, we need to make some adjustments, but nothing, nothing, the, nothing critical. Thank you. I'm watching some great conversation in the chat here about um, vendor conceptual lock-in, and Kyle, I like what you're saying about really focusing on teaching the fundamentals. Yeah, uh, and I want to just add one more thing to that because the reason we teach Hadoop and MapReduce in the beginning of the course is, is exactly that. It's, that is the foundation. Those are the building blocks that you need to understand um, in order to write anything, you know, in that kind of MapReduce paradigm. Um, so, Hopefully, you know, even if you're using a Databricks notebook or if you're using AWS, all of the code that you're writing in, in the course is written from scratch. It's, you know, it's probably not how you would, uh, you know, run, run algorithms in production because you don't want to be implementing everything from scratch, but we teach those fundamentals, right? So that even when you go off into industry, and uh, you're using pre-built algorithms, you know how to fine tune them, right? Because you know what, what it means to fine tune those algorithms. You know how things work under the hood. So even, even if you switch from you know, Hadoop to a different kind of MapReduce framework, you know fundamentally what's going on. You know that you're mapping over some data and then you're folding that they're reducing that data, right? So hopefully <laughs> the, the objective um, is for people to learn enough of the fundamentals and the, the, the guts of, of, 
writing algorithms at scale that it can really take them to any any framework and any provider. I think there's a question on Kubernetes and Databrook, how they are different. So um, think about uh, Kubernetes. Again, it's, it's a product from Google. Now Kubernetes is part of the cloud uh, native foundation. Um, I, don't, I don't remember the exact name, but now it's like open to everybody. And, uh, but, but Kubernetes is basically a, 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 um, a, um, um, an engine to create a cluster and you can load any application that it's containerized, right? So data proc will be an instance of Kubernetes that, is, that you're running Spark or you're running Hadoop, very specific, pretty much locked in to that. And uh, what, what Google does is basically um, has a similar template for GKE and then it loads like very specific components. So you're able to run uh, Spark, Hadoop, Presto, Hive, etc. right? So. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I feel like we should wrap up here. So thank you very much to Kyle and Luis. And if we could just pop over to the slides for just one quick wrap up. Well, we're doing that, awesome. Yeah, so thank you very much to all of our speakers, the attendees, the plannies for this event. Um, we will be back in July, last Thursday of the month at one o'clock. Um, we are still figuring, we're still planning what exactly the topic is for that. Like I said, in August, we will doing, be doing something on the PRP. So hope to see you for that. And I wish you all a good day. And thank you again to Kyle and Luis.